one thing I think we should just identify here. Okay. I, I feel we need to work on our segues. You know what I'm like? I When something happens, I, I struggle to not immediately just talk about yes. it. You know, sometimes when I think something and you're like, yeah. you can tell my face on this podcast is like, you're looking at me, you're smiling at me. What are you? Dan, I don't know if you pick it up on the mic, <laughs> but sometimes I hear this noise when Dan is desperate to speak. <laughs> <laughs> We're just a couple of business anchors. Welcome to the Business Anchors Podcast. This jingle is slightly too long. This jingle is slightly too long. Why are we talking about sales strategies, then? Before we get into that, I want to do something that we haven't planned for that you don't know about, Lloyd. Oh, you're already I, you're smirking. I'm so. really sorry, but this is nothing to do with this episode, but just quickly... Uh, upstairs, Lloyd told a hilarious story just before we walked down here that I just really want to share with you about how he was uncontrollably sobbing the other night <laughs> whilst watching a film. Oh, we're doing this, are we? At the yeah, just quickly. Episode? Okay. Um, so you watched a film and you just yes. were uncontrollably sobbing for like half yes. an hour. I don't know the name. I can't remember the name of the film. It's about a father and a son. <laughs> Um, it <laughs> makes it sound less of a cry film when I tell you the main character is Steve Carell. <laughs> so it makes it sound more like a comedy, but it was it was sad. It was about a father and a son, and the son, when he's like a teenager, basically becomes a drug addict. Mm. And I <laughs> I would say I'm I'm the sort of person that wears wears my heart on my sleeve, <laughs> but it went a bit too far here <laughs> because it got to the point where after the film had finished. <laughs> Probably 20 minutes after, I was just on the sofa on my own, like sobbing into my own shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> well, your um, wife was actually concerned yeah, about it. Sarah was just kind of like, oh, sorry that I chose that film. Are you all right? And I was like, yeah. Uh-huh. That is such a Lloyd story. I'm sorry. He's told mm. that upstairs just now and I had to share that with the anchors. Yeah. Didn't feel um, good, actually. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, getting mm. into this week's episode. Yes. Thanks for sharing that, Lloyd. Um. So why are we talking about sales strategies? I think for me, one of my favorite things to do on this podcast is share lessons we're learning whilst growing our video and social media marketing agency. And sometimes those lessons come from shit stuff we've done and mistakes we've made. Like we quite like to just be transparent and share. Yeah, you do a lot of shit. I do a lot of shit stuff. You know, yeah. oh, we did this thing wrong and this is what we learned. And there's lots of that. However, this week's episode is based on lessons we've learned from doing something very right. Ah, so I must have been heavily involved. No, no, no. You weren't actually because it was to do with sales. And that's my remit. Right. <laughs> so um, so in July, we um, we converted over £125,000 of new business, which was really great. Whoop, whoop. And I thought that it could be good for the anchors. We've kind of picked out five key lessons that uh, both Lloyd and I have sort of learned from what did we do in July uh, that worked so well. And hopefully you anchors will listen to this and think, ah, I might try that within my business or that kind of marketing approach within my company. So yeah, that's what we're doing this episode. Um, So I want to start with my first lesson, Lloyd, if that's all right. Cool. I do. One thing I think we should just identify here. Okay. I I feel we need to work on our segues. Right. We went from sobbing straight into (laughs) sales. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, t- to me, as a you know, just just speaking on behalf of the <laughs> listeners, it was a bit jarring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so next time, you know, we got these little ones crea- on coaching. Think creatively, <laughs> as podcast hosts, you know, maybe yeah. you know, get into your radio DJ kind of head. You know, yeah. talking of uh, sobbing, <laughs> uh, you know, this this floor will be soaking wet once we boil those super soakers with all the money we've made in sales <laughs> oh, no, that yeah. okay no it's just thinking <laughs> of my feet there that wasn't a good yeah. one but no, we've got to work on this we do plan a lot but then sometimes random shit happens that i just have to tell the anchors i you know what i'm like i when something happens i, I struggle to not immediately just talk about yes. it you know sometimes when i think something and you're like yeah. you can tell my face on this podcast is like you're looking at me you're smiling at me what are you dan <laughs> by the way dan i don't know if you pick it up on the mic <laughs> but sometimes i hear this noise when dan is desperate to speak while i'm speaking <laughs> on the podcast i hear this <laughs> and it's literally he cannot stop himself like his brain is like i've got something good to say i have to say it right now and it's the same in our morning oh, i stand i stand up in our morning meetings in front of everyone in the business and dan no. is right next to me and i hear I? the same noise then when i'm talking about 
whatever I'm talking right. about, Dan suddenly thinks of something. Oh, I've got to share it with the room. And I hear, <laughs> <laughs> can I give myself credit here, right? Let me give myself credit because you are right. But the reason I make that noise is because I'm self-aware and I know that I shouldn't be shouting what I'm thinking at you. So I stop myself, but I, I just, I'm just about to say it and then I stop myself. That's why I go, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, you know, I think oh. just we need to be, we need to be critical yeah. of each other. No, no, you're right. Performance, and it is weird, both yeah. on the podcast and in meetings, when you do your, <laughs> Because your brain is so desperate to oh, say, "Oh man, I, that's something's going on there." Mm. Yeah, yeah, you got weird shit going on. And talking about weird shit going on, yes. my first lesson. Yeah, it's, right. How, <laughs> no, that, that how wasn't strong a good segue. Is segue? That was. It is not a segue here. Let oh. me just share my first lesson. Okay. But good point, Lloyd. We will. We will work on that. Okay. Um. Well, how something you... else we'll work on <laughs> is about uh, the quote: "Nobody ever regret, regrets regrets qualifying out." This is, a, which <laughs> this is a brilliant segue. Oh, this is falling apart this episode. There's actually loads of good stuff we're sharing this episode. So stick around. We will put it together shortly. Um, so the first lesson, Lloyd, this is actually a really important one, is about qualifying in sales. And I want to tell you a story. Uh, so you, you would have heard this story before, but a brief story. Um, back when we started business, one of the things we used to do a lot was going out networking. One of our first, pod I think our first ever podcast episode was about episode one. weird shit that happens when you go out networking. Iconic. Definitely listen to that. The production value is a lot worse than it is now, but the information is still good. And um, we're a lot more nervous talking, but it's still good. And um, one of the things is networking. And when uh, I was out networking, I met, this, I met this lady at this breakfast that said, you pass leads to each other, basically. I've got an opportunity yeah. for you. And some people just make up leads each week and it's annoying. But this lady said to me, oh, I've got this lead, this, per this bloke I spoke to. Go and he wants help with marketing and you do Facebook. I think that's what she said. You do Facebook. That was like, well, how good we were at communicating what we did. So we did Facebook. So she put me in touch with this guy who was in Maidstone. And I messaged him. I think he wanted me to WhatsApp him or whatever. And I said, oh, let's meet up and I can talk about stuff. And he gave me some information. I spent about five hours preparing for this meeting because it, it was one of the first ones we were yeah. doing and like over preparing. Drove to Maystone, met him, ended up having a chat and it got into the conversation of budget. And it, it was actually someone that rented out bouncy castles, which was the first alarm bell I didn't notice. Uh, I would, you know, What have you got against people that rent out no, bouncy castles? No, nothing against people that rent bouncy castles, but just unless you're one of the biggest bouncy car it rental places. Like in, had something against bouncy no, castles. No, 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 nothing against bouncy castle people. Um, and when he got to budget, he had a £50 budget. And bear in mind, I spent five hours prepping, the fuel there and back, probably made up about £50 or more, um, which which comes on to my point here. The thing I got wrong in that point years ago, very naively, was I didn't effectively qualify that opportunity. What do you mean by qualifying the opportunity just for the anchors? So qualifying an opportunity is all about understanding, is this an opportunity worth pursuing? Is it worth my time? Do they fit a certain amount, a, a certain set of criteria that it's worth me pursuing? Do they have a problem that I solve? Mm. Are they the decision maker? There's, there's a whole range of different things. Right. And one of the books I've just finished reading last night, Lloyd, which I've mentioned in a few episodes, is a book called Medic, which is a qualifying uh, framework, an acronym that outlines certain criteria you need to tick to qualify someone. Highly recommend anyone who's looking to improve their qualification framework to go and, um, to, I won't go into too much detail, but go and check out that book. It's okay. really, really good. And the one quote, you know, like you get one key takeaway from a book. The one quote that I really impacted me and was the best takeaway was the thing that, that Andy White says, the author, he says, nobody ever regret, regrets qualifying out. Why can't I say regrets? You struggle with that one. Nobody mate. ever regrets. Nobody ever regrets. Qualifying out. And what he means by that is a lot of people in sales, and I can resonate with this, when you're selling, if someone's shown some level of interest, you, you constantly want to chase it and chase it and spend your time chasing them up. Are you interested yet? Are you interested yet? But a lot of those opportunities don't fit the criteria. So you should qualify them out and not chase them up and then move on to new opportunities where they do meet more of the qualifying criteria. A lot of people in business would be thinking, well, that's a missed opportunity. Like, why wouldn't you be following up with every opportunity? Like, there's, there's the chance that this person is going to buy from you yeah. Why would you not? Why would you not follow up every opportunity? Well, uh, you do follow up with every opportunity, but 
you you thought the, the the stage one is the qualification stage where you ask a set of questions very briefly to really gauge are they serious about working with me do they have a problem i can solve are they the decision maker do they have a budget mm. um so there's a whole set of criteria there's another book called gap selling by a guy called keenan which again is one of my favorite sales books which talks about an even <laughs> Did you say by a guy called Keenan? Yeah. Is that just his first name? His name's Keenan and they, he, he refers to himself as Keenan. Oh, he's just like a one, he's like Seal. Y yeah, yeah, yeah. On Madonna. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I was just, I thought like, weird you're talking about this no, author, no. like your mates with him. No. Oh yeah, just Keenan. No, 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 no Keenan's name. his name. Okay. Um, And so yeah, it's, it is all about qualifying and something I did in July after reading this, these books was I started to be a lot stricter with who I was qualifying out. So I'd ask a set of questions and figure out is it an opportunity worth pursuing? And if it was, I'd continue. If not, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And I think all the anchors listening should do this more. To answer your question, why don't you continue following up lots of opportunities? If you think you've only got a finite amount of time and energy in your day and in your week, don't you want to spend that time engaging with the most lucrative opportunities that are most likely to convert into customers yeah. rather so than... So you could have 10 opportunities to pursue. You could spend 10% of your time on each of those opportunities and maybe you don't even have that much time. So you might, a few might fall off because you, mm. you might not have the time or you could be like, right, six of these actually have qualified out. It doesn't, yeah. and when I've asked those questions, mm. it doesn't seem like it's going to be worth my time following up. I'm focusing on these four. Yeah. It's going to be much more worth it for me to put more time into these yes. four. Yes, yes, mm. yes. Yeah, so as an action anchors, please go and read Gap Selling and the book called Medic. Really, really great if you're looking to improve your sales and qualification process. Nice. I, um, you, you're going to have to keep your thoughts in your own head briefly, Dan. Mm. You try not to make too many noises. <laughs> I mean, no, it's your turn. Um, my turn now. I want to talk about something that's massively, I think, has a massive impact on sales. And this is more to do with um, selling to your to your current customers and clients. So say you if you're a service-based business like us you've got a contract of a month three months 12 months whatever it is and you want to make sure you um can extend that or you know uh have that customer as an ongoing customer for a long mm -hmm. period of time it's customer perception is just as important as the actual work you're doing and the actual results so um for a long time, we, we've been working with Cameo Apples, uh, one of our longest standing clients for like six or seven years, mm -hmm. something like that now. Um, and so long that I was actually previously responsible for a lot more of the work we did for Cameo Apples when we first work, worked for them. We had a smaller team and I was much more heavily involved. And uh, we're really lucky that Cameo Apples have been a very happy customer and we've achieved great things for them throughout the years. Um, and our kind of work that we've done with them has, has grown with Cameo Apples and with Knowlton. Um, and we've been getting better results for them year on year, every single year, which is a great thing to say. But, but. as an example here <laughs> of, of this customer perception thing, I think it was last year or the year before, I was actually responsible for communicating with the client ah uh, yeah. yes so let's talk about something when it all started going downhill something that i've done wrong. <laughs> i'm gonna be open about this um we were basically smashing smashing it with what we're trying to achieve so all the kpis we had all the things we we're trying to achieve with the client we were hit it we were exceeding all these goals reaching millions of people online yeah. engaging thousands of people helping to get stocked in top supermarkets we were like yeah. killing it so it's like Great. We've worked hard on this. We're continuing to do a really good job with this client. Really happy with what we're doing. And we had lots of other stuff going on within within the business. And because I thought like, well, we're like by far exceeding all of our targets and stuff. In my head, I'm thinking, brilliant. There's, you know, th this client is just the happiest client ever. Mm. There's no way they they couldn't be. And they were happy. But I was so focused on delivering that great work. And I didn't focus on communicating the great work that we were delivering. Mm -hmm. And and that year, it actually resulted in them being less happy, mm -hmm. even though they had, we achieved far better results than the previous year. And this is something, luckily, we have a very open relationship, something they communicate at the end of the year, something that could be improved. Mm -hmm. They said, oh, the we firstly, they said about communication. We're like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, we'd like to know more. There was some period of time where, and... 
uh, where we didn't, and we also realised that. Th- from what their fee- from their feedback, they didn't actually realise quite how brilliant <laughs> mm. the stuff uh, we'd done was, and quite how brilliant the results were. And I was thinking, how did they? You know, why would they not be as happy as last yeah, year? We didn't make sense. Did smashed it. it. And so, so, like, can you believe it? You can be doing a better result, or providing better services or products to your customers, and they can be less happy. Mm. And and this is something we've realized over the past sort of year and we've been continuing to try and do better on uh, with our business. Um, not just giving the client what they want, but ensuring we have the communication in place so that the client's perception of what's going on is much higher. So, for example, you could be doing excellent work, but just a, a message here and there to say, oh, by the way, we've been working on this, this and this. It's mm-hmm. going really well. This has been challenging. We've worked hard on this this week, but um, this has worked really well. Mm. I think then giving your customers uh, a bit of a look inside the process. Oh, wow. There's been a few people working on this for us this week and they're working really hard. And suddenly that customer perception is up there with the standard of work you're doing. I think this is especially important for service-based businesses Mm. because your customer doesn't see all the work and thought process and energy mm-hmm. and resource that goes into achieving that small thing that they see yeah like oh some posts on social media yeah you know or your accounts being done they don't see all the legwork and hard work that's mm-hmm. gone in the background so telling them that and talking them through that is can, we, can help overcome that challenge we got it? this wrong we thought better work so better services or better products equals happier customers and actually that's not necessarily the case you also have to work on the customer perception and what they perceive even if it is better work better products Mm. better services the communication involved it has a a far bigger involvement than you'd necessarily think and uh focusing on customer perception of your products or services make future sales so much easier so the key takeaway here from me uh i think think about what you can do to improve your customer's perception as well as maintaining that high standard of work or products or services you're delivering for them so communication is the main one showing the effort and the work that's being put in even if the results Mm -hmm. are brilliant still communicating the effort the hard work the thoughts whatever it is that's going into it and um also show them that you care Mm. it's that these little bits of communication that actually don't mean much shows that you really care the small yeah. message so from us as a marketing agency i know that uh little personal messages from me to mm. brand owners and things like that where i actually say oh i've just just caught up with the team on last week's results yeah. great that we've started seeing x or whatever and that that you know that isn't a strategy for me of like trying to do things but that seems to be really really appreciated so something we've been doing that i've noticed that i really like that Mm. the team do is sending little updates on slack even photos and stuff to to clients showing them behind the scenes like in the studio stuff we've been doing like oh today we had the shoot for xyz Mm. and it just keeps them in the loop it's that communication part of like look at this cool stuff we're doing for you behind the scenes we're not just twiddling twiddling our thumbs here example in messaging as well so we i've talked quite a lot about service-based businesses like us but say you're selling products so something that uh could communicate the effort uh and improve customer perception could be rather than putting a note inside a package saying sorry our packaging isn't compostable Mm. you could say we're excited to let you know our team are working hard towards the goal of 100 percent compostable packaging in the meantime all of our packaging is recyclable so that change in messaging one just says yeah sorry this isn't mm. what we'd want it and one communicates our team are working really hard towards this goal that we think you as a customer will care about we're not quite there this is where we are at the moment and that customer perception is completely different with that yeah. those different types of messaging so the second statement communicates the effort being put in towards what the customer wants yeah love it that's really cool. And that, that actually ties in nicely to my next lesson, Lloyd. I thought I heard some noise there. <laughs> <laughs> About relationship building. Nice. And the importance of relationship building and being patient. So looking at, in July, one of the most lucrative uh, new clients that we converted actually came from someone who 
I've known for years and years and years, probably from when I was about 17. Mm -hmm. um, someone that I knew growing up went to another school that was my age. I sort of knew them uh, uh, from going out and partying and every now and again would say hello and got on with them well. There was no strategy, like business strategy involved in building this relationship. It was just like, we got on and over a period of years, we continued to build that relationship. And then about five years ago, this person's sister got in contact with me about supporting her with to develop a strategy for her business. So we worked with her to, to deliver a strategy development day, supported her, did a really good job, and they were really happy. Um, so that was like five years ago. Yeah. And then uh, maintained this relationship with this person I've known for years. And then a couple of years ago, they got in touch about working on a project. Didn't quite work out for whatever reason, mm -hmm. but maintained that relationship. And then uh, a few months ago, they got in touch again about this this opportunity for a new brand that was um, being launched into the UK. A really innovative product, which I'm sure you'll see more about as we work more on that project. Um, but got in touch with us about that. And we converted that as a client in July all because we'd built that relationship up over literally 10 plus years without having a strategy in mind to, to mm. build that relationship. I think this is one of the mistakes people make. They understand the importance of relationship building, but they think of it too much as a robotic strategy that's like, I'm going to meet this person at this event. Mm. I'm going to ask them what they're interested in. Whereas really to build meaningful, authentic relationships, you can't necessarily always have like a proactive strategy around it. I do think if you looked at the income of our business now, a big proportion is made up from clients that uh, there's some kind of link with this kind of long-term relationship that's been built over the t over time. For example, I spoke about Cameo Apples that we've worked with for years. That was through a relationship with another agency that um, that put the work our way because they, they didn't think it was yeah. uh, hugely valuable. And in the end, it has become very valuable for us. Um, and like you're saying, that was a friend yeah. and then a friend's sister and something you didn't know that would lead to the work that we're currently doing mm. with that client. I remember a couple of years ago, we, <laughs> it's one of those things that sort of happened accidentally, but we realized the power of relationship building because we did an activity and I recommend everyone should do this. Look at your closed deals or closed clients, which means look at clients you've won uh, or yeah, look at your clients you've won over the last however many years and ask yourself the question, um, where did that client come from? And you can start to look at patterns of, oh, that one came through, mm. uh, you know, social media or through a relationship we built. And we looked at a load of our close clients and most of them were through relationships we built over the years. And we were like, hmm, we need to put more energy into building yeah. these meaningful relationships. And that's very, uh, that's very specific to service-based businesses, that kind of thing. But I'd say even for product-based businesses, it, not necessarily on the sales side, although it, it could be depending on how you work, but um, there's lots of benefits that can come from those long-term relationships. It may be suppliers, it may be marketers, it may, you know, it could be any part of your business, but those long-term relationships can can really have a big difference uh, for product-based businesses as well. Yeah. Another quick example, this podcast, I know you hate the meta, it's very meta, but people ask about like Adobe Express sponsoring the podcast. How did they sponsor our pod? Mm. That was through a relationship we'd built over years and years and years who had seen, seen what we were doing online and the content we were creating, that uh, someone who grew a company that was bought by Adobe that then put us in contact with them. They saw what we were doing and they now sponsor the podcast. So yeah, there's so many things that have happened if you look at uh, our business and, and the, the down to relationships. And we actually did a podcast episode, episode 119, uh, why relationships are critical to grow your business and how to nurture them. We'll be going into a lot more detail if anchors are list interested in listening to that. Great. Um, Dan, I would like to talk about what our customers actually want. Yeah, go on. Okay. Tell me so more. I think a massive lesson in sales is focusing on what your, cost cu what your customers, <laughs> what your customers actually want, not what you want to give them. So I think uh, a lot of businesses fall into the trap where they're, they kind of focus on their internal stuff going on in their business and the people within the business conversations and they forget their customers. And um, a bit of a story, we worked with Design Cloud um, uh, on, or originally on awareness campaigns, so kind of big video shoots uh, to create some awareness content that they would then use in their marketing. And um, it went really well and um, eventually well, there, there was a bit of a gap 
in so we worked with them on two projects i think then there was a bit of a gap um and then uh spoke to them again and we realized that um these kind of big peaks in this content that they'd got and then the kind of trust where they had nothing in between didn't necessarily work for them anymore so they'd get this content that we produce in this big awareness shoot they'd use it and then uh with social media marketing quite often ads can hit fatigue so they might have pumped thousands and thousands into this ad and then it's kind of like oh, okay we've kind of the people that we're mm. targeting have seen this now so what do we put in front of them now um and then there was a point where like oh we haven't really got enough to mm -hmm. to show them now we haven't <laughs> created enough con enough content um so we listened to that and then actually suggested a different type of work in, with the moving forward a monthly retainer model where we do a much lower level production every single month and give them a constant flow of content to feed into their online ads and their marketing strategy. And this is now a longstanding customer. We've worked with them on this basis for over a year now, providing mm -hmm. content for them uh, continuously for over a year to feed into their strategy. And I, I think it's just such a, uh, a good thing for us to learn like if we just try to continue to sell them what we wanted to sell them mm. they wouldn't have been a customer moving forward and a really happy customer but we listen to what they actually need and want that what exactly what their business wants and the customer mm. wants adapted and worked out how we could give them that and i think a takeaway from this is do you feel like your business is trying to convince customers to buy something that you want to sell mm. to them mm. Uh, we uh, we spoke in a sauna this morning Dan, oh, about yeah. this type of business. Like, how good is it? Like a business where <laughs> that's yeah, a bit, a bit weird. But that's, <laughs> this happened. Um, we're talking about uh, some people have a business where you constantly have to like try and persuade these people to, that your thing you're selling is something it's they worth should get. It. Please buy and it. And then there's some products or services where there's no persuasion needed. It's like, I need this thing. I'm mm. trying to find. Oh yeah, you you've got that. Mm -hmm. Please give that to me. And if you can innovate and change and look at what your customers actually want and change your product or service to fit those needs, it's going to be a much easier sale. Yeah, that, that conversation came from uh, an episode of My First Million. They were talking about one chart businesses. So a one chart business is where someone literally builds a whole business around a certain trend that they've seen on a chart. And they gave this example of Jeff Bezos and Amazon. So Jeff Bezos was... Um, uh, had a really successful career in uh, stocks and shares and investing. And he saw a trend uh, that the internet was growing 2000% a year. And he quit his job and started an internet company, Amazon, because of that one chart or one trend that he saw. Mm. Um, and like we were talking about this morning, like developing a business idea to have the most success, you want to be creating something that's on, off the back of a trend where there, there's growth in that area. So for example, like AI, that's a good example now. AI is continuously growing. If you're creating a business in AI, you know, you're putting yourself, you're giving yourself a lot better chance of success because more people are just looking for more kind of opportunities to use AI than another business that is trending downwards. Um, so yeah, definitely check out the one chart business. There's, there's a company called Trends that has a newsletter that shares all these kind of and charts. What, what podcast was that? that you My First Million. Oh yeah, that's one of your favorites. Uh, yeah. It's one of those ones where I... Uh, I, I only listen to that now because they, they release like three episodes a week, but I absolutely lap it up. Oh, we, oh, we, we lap it up. <laughs> nice. And Dan, you, I believe, are, have got one more lesson and it's quite a, I think this is very timely. We're giving business anchors um, a chance to get ahead of the curve here. Yes. This is the thing that I'm most excited about in marketing right now. I'm glad you said marketing and not life because that would have been No, not life. Although I, I was looking at this the other week, Saturday night at like midnight, setting these ads up because I'm sad. But LinkedIn thought leader ads. This is the biggest opportunity for B2B marketers right now is to run LinkedIn thought leader ads. So let me just explain what they are. Traditionally, when running ads on LinkedIn, you've had to distribute them through a LinkedIn company page. And LinkedIn company pages have always been more difficult to get traction with due to people, like my theory is that people resonate with people a lot more. Like how often when you see a company's post in your feed, do you feel like an urge to comment on it versus another human being? Mm. You know, is that, is that whole like- Especially on social media, maybe except Twitter or X as it's now known mm. as, it's very rare that um, 
kind of brands and company pages get much traction exactly so traditionally we you've, you had to run ads through a company page however now with linkedin thought leader ads you can amplify organic posts from a personal profiles account and let me just explain like why that's so powerful so for us as an example linkedin has been huge in helping us generate business through my personal profile we've had a lot of success with organically attracting and converting new business through my personal LinkedIn, all the work the team does is then distributed through my account. Mm. Um, now we can amplify that and get and get that content that we know has worked organically in front of our ideal customers of CMOs, head of marketing that work for brands. And it's, it's shown to be way more effective than running ads through a LinkedIn company page. So anyone that, that has had any kind of success organically through their personal profile on LinkedIn, highly recommend testing these thought leader ads because it's a way of scaling up what's worked organically and can can anyone run those ads now yes through a company you need to have a company page set up because you, you still need to you still need to run them through your company account the, yeah but you can you set them up through your company account and the ads show as if they're from a personal profile mm -hmm. to set these up just a couple of things that i realized you can only set these up with the reach or engagement objective okay um and you have to basically when you're setting them up, choose your employee and request permission to amplify their personal posts. It's quite a simple process. Right. Uh, Do you know why it's only reach and engagement that you can... I don't know, to be honest. It's frustrating because I want to test way more objectives, but mm. I, I've tested re engagement, I've tested reach, and for us, reach has worked, been a lot more effective because it's got more people uh, seeing our content, visiting my profile, who, who I can then send LinkedIn outreach videos to, which mm -hmm. is a whole strategy we we implement to, to generate new leads, which we've spoken about in a previous episode. Okay. But definitely worth checking out. Yeah. I know that we're quite excited about this opportunity at the moment. Yeah. It's the results we're seeing initially are really good. Yeah. Great. So there you go. Five of those key lessons that have helped us get really good results in July. Now you have all the tools to go and sell loads of stuff you want to sell. Yeah. Go and do it. I'm buying. And... I'm really excited. Next week, Lloyd, we're going to be talking about how to leverage nostalgia in marketing. I love nostalgia in marketing. Just want to, sorry. Good. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about re how we're relaunching our iconic 90s brand uh, and lots of interesting stories about that. So you've got to stick around to oh, listen to God, next I mean, week's if episode. that's already live, I'd say just listen to it straight away now. And if and it's if, not live, if it's not, just wait. Just, just look at wherever you're listening to podcasts until it <laughs> pops up. And then listen to it. But what else could they do if, if it's not there, Lloyd? Is there another like call to action yes, or something they could is. do? Is there? What could yes, they do? Yes, <laughs> they could leave a review. They could leave a review. Because that's the payment for this podcast. <laughs> yeah, you think it's free. Yeah, you think it's free, but it's not. Now you need to pay with a review, <laughs> please. I've done this before. I know the call to action. Good life. Well done. We look forward to seeing those reviews. And we'll see, see you in your ears, ears next week. week. Just before you go, we want to take a second to talk about our podcast sponsors, Adobe Express. Adobe Express enables anyone to quickly and easily create standout social graphics, logos, flyers, banners, and more on the web and mobile. There are so many amazing features and benefits to using Adobe Express. You can choose from thousands of beautifully designed templates to inspire you and get started. You can quickly remove a background, convert JPEG to PNG, videos to GIFs, merge videos, change video speeds and more. Apply your brand to your content in just a tap and collaborate with your colleagues through shared templates and libraries. You'll also get access to the entire diverse royalty-free Adobe Stock photo collection created by the world's best professionals and choose from over 20,000 licensed Adobe fonts, as well as their collection of curved typesets, grids, and exquisite font pairings. You can apply standout photo effects in seconds, discover easy bite-sized tips to get you started on the Learn tab, or connect on one of their creative community spaces to stay close to our team and fellow users. Now that's a lot of features to get your teeth into. Click the link in the description of the episode to give Adobe Express a go today and we'll see you next week.